Rule Book of Revelation that in end times Israelis have had to endure terrorist attacks We are in end times, ladies and gentlemen, whether you like it or not. The rate of HIV AIDS in the U.S. capital is higher than any other city Life in America. Life footage of as the tsunami. In essence, of the Berlin Wall doesn't mean anything anymore. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down. Mexico are having microchips implanted. So the dead and the starving of Somalia already knew it. My friends, in the end times, this is what it'll be like. It'll be ten times. That looks like a second plane. It just blew up and made explosions. People started running. It was just chaos everywhere. It's difficult to uh, imagine just precisely how this thing will manifest itself. No one had expected that something like this was about to happen. All right, well, let's grab our Bibles. We're back in our Revelation series again. And I want you to turn to two chapters with me, if you would, please. Revelation chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter 37. And we're going to look at both of those together. And the title of my message is Israel, Iran, and America in Bible Prophecy. Revelation 1, Ezekiel 37. Little note, also, next week we'll be back in our regular series. This is sort of a special message in the series, but we'll be looking at Revelation chapter 8 and 9. So you might want to read ahead. Hurry. <laughs> Let's pray together. Father, we know that you're in control. And we know that one day Jesus Christ will come again to this earth. And there are signs of the times you have given to us in the pages of Scripture. Things to alert us to the fact that your coming is close, near, imminent. Help us now to pay attention to those signs. And I pray that everyone listening to this message will be ready to meet you. And if they aren't yet, that they will be ready today. We commit this time of Bible study to you now. In Jesus' name. Amen. So... <laughs> What on earth is happening in the Middle East right now? Seems like every time you turn around there's another outbreak of violence or the threat of one. Iranian President Ahmadinejad has stood before the U UN and has threatened to once again eliminate Israel. And then in his most recent speech he spoke of some Islamic Messiah and a new world order. What's that? all about. And then we look at this attack against our embassies around the world, specifically in the Middle East and most notably in Libya where American Ambassador Chris Stevens was shot in cold blood by terrorists. What is this all about? I thought the war on terrorism was being won. I thought when we took out Osama bin Laden that might be the end of it. Hardly. In fact, after Ambassador Stevens was killed, there were people in the streets rioting, burning American flags, waiting for their tight shot from American media as they chanted together to the camera, take a picture, Obama, we're all Osama. So that pretty much says it all. The message of Osama bin Laden, the message of the terrorists is alive and well. And what about this Arab Spring? I thought that was going to turn things around, perhaps some kind of a a resurgence, of, not resurgence, but a surge of democracy in the Middle East. That didn't turn out so well either. What is the explanation of all of this chaos and this confusion? What in the world is happening? Short answer, Bible prophecy is happening in real time before our very eyes. The Bible has predicted the things that are happening in this part of the world. The Hebrew prophets thousands of years ago foretold the scattering and regathering together of the Jewish people into their homeland. And Scripture specifically tells us that once they were regathered, world history as we know it would culminate in this part of the world. The war to end all wars would take place in this world. And the attention of the planet would be directed toward Israel and toward the little city of Jerusalem. Is that happening right now? Yes, it is. And that's why we're studying the book of Revelation 
together. You see, God's plan is not to conceal, it is to reveal. And the fact is, is that the word revelation, and by the way, it's revelation, singular, not revelations. I don't know why people insist on in calling this the book of revelations. Revelation means the unveiling. So here in this great book, God has unveiled so many things for us. In fact, the book of Revelation is like the ultimate action thriller. Anyone who loves a great novel has to love this book. It has drama, suspense, mystery, horror. It tells of rebellion, unprecedented economic collapse, and the ultimate war of history. But yet despite these ominous happenings, it also bursts and radiates with joy and hope. It ends with a happy ending as sin and death are banished forever. So the reason we want to learn about the future is to motivate us to live right in the present. Let me repeat that. We learn about the future to motivate us to live right in the present. Because some would say, well, it's not important to study Bible prophecy. It doesn't matter. Besides, no one can sort it out. I beg to differ. I think we must study Bible prophecy. And it will help us to know what is happening in our world. And it will also help us to live more godly lives. Some are perplexed by this book and I would not say I have it all worked out or figured out. I don't think anyone does. But I think much of it can be understood. And there is a key to unlocking the book of Revelation. Adrian Rogers called it the golden key to the book of Revelation. And that golden key is right there on the front door in Revelation chapter 1 verse 19 where Jesus tells John, banished to the island of Patmos in this unveiling of the future, to write the things that you have seen, the things which are, and the things that will take place after this. A revelation is unique in that it comes with its own outline. It tells us about our past, present and future. First, Jesus tells John to write about the things that he has seen. And that's what we have looked at in chapter 1. We have seen in chapter 1 the resurrected and glorified Jesus with all power on heaven and earth. The revealed Jesus who is complete, in complete control of what is about to happen. So chapter 1, the things that you have seen, reveals God is on the throne. God's in control. Don't freak out. Okay? That's a loose paraphrase. Number two, John is to write that which will take place after these things. Now, uh, excuse me, I, I left out a part. Number two, he's to write about the things which are, rather. And this is a reference to the message of Jesus to the seven churches that we looked at in Revelation chapters two to three. You remember starting with the church of uh, Ephesus and ending with the church of Laodicea. Those are the things which are. And now we're looking at the future. The things that will take place after these things. These are the events spoken of in Revelation chapters 4 to 22. So summing it up, we see the Lord's person, we see the Lord's people, and we see the Lord's program. Chapter 1 is the revelation of the glorified Christ. Chapters 2 to 3, we have basically the entire scope of church history. Chapters 4 to 5, we see the church taken up to heaven. In chapters 6 to 19, we have the great tribulation period. In chapter 20, we see the millennium. Finally, in chapters 21 to 22, we have the new heaven and the new earth. Now, sort of to pull back and get the big picture of the prophetic scenario, uh, let's try to sort it out. What is the next event on the prophetic calendar? <clears throat> Is it the second coming of Jesus? No, because that happens at the end of the Great Tribulation period during the uh, Battle of Armageddon. All right, so what is the next event on the prophetic calendar? It is my opinion that the next event is the rapture of the church. Now you know the difference between the rapture and the second coming, right? And the rapture, he comes for his church, and the second coming, he comes with his church. In the rapture, we're caught up to meet the Lord in heaven. In the second coming, he comes back from heaven with us. What goes up must come down. And I believe that this event, the rapture, uh, coming from the word rapturus, uh, is, could happen at any moment. 
And the Bible says it will happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Two will be in the field, one will be taken, one will be left. Uh, so this could happen at any time. And I hope that we're all ready for that. And if we aren't, I'll tell you how to be uh, at the end of this message. So that would probably happen soon. Then what? Well, somewhere either right before or right after the rapture, it seems to me that a large force from the north of Israel, identified in Ezekiel 37, 38, and 39 as Magog, will move against her along with her allies. And we'll talk about that more in a few moments. Then what? Then a charismatic world leader emerges on the scene. A man with economic solutions. A man with a peace treaty that will be signed by both the Israelis and the Arabs. A man that will uh, presumably help the Jewish people rebuild their temple again. A man that will be hailed by some as the very Messiah, as the Christ. But the Bible instead calls him the Antichrist. And remember that prefix anti doesn't just mean against, which he is, but it also means instead of. In many ways, Antichrist will be masquerading as a Messiah and will be thought of as a Messiah by some. So for the first three and a half years of the tribulation period, also known as the 70th week of Daniel, there is this global peace. It seems like it's a good thing, but then there's that halfway mark that is called the abomination of desolation. This is after the Antichrist erects an image of himself in the rebuilt temple there in Jerusalem and commands people to worship it. And this is the point at which the cataclysmic judgment of God falls upon the earth. And we're going to be looking at that more in our next uh, look at Revelation. And then this culminates in the final battle to be fought, the battle of Armageddon. Now I'm not talking about Carmageddon. You probably heard about that. That's a shutting down of the 405. This is Armageddon. And Armageddon will happen in Israel. You say, well, how do you know that? Because the word Armageddon is taken from the root word Armageddon or the word Megiddo. So basically the battle of Armageddon is a description of where the battle will be fought in the valley of Megiddo right there in Israel. So as this battle is raging, Christ comes back again. This is where he returns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And armies are riding with him in heaven as he returns on the white horse. Air Horse One, right? <laughs> then we come back to this earth and the millennium begins. How long is the millennium? It's a thousand years. In fact, the word millennium means 1,000. So it's a thousand year reign of Christ. This is the time we read of where uh, the lamb is with the lion and so forth. A beautiful time. Satan is bound during the millennium reign of Christ. And then Satan is released for a short time and he is then banished to the lake of fire. Then the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven to earth so heaven and earth effectively become one. And we'll talk about this later but it's important to point out because sometimes people will say, well I'm just going to die and go to heaven and live in heaven forever. Actually that's not true. Because one day heaven and earth will become one. You're going to come back to the earth again in a glorified body. So this is all that is yet ahead in the big picture of the prophetic scenario. So let's come back to today. Where are we at right now? Well, I want to focus in on Israel, Iran, and America in the light of Bible prophecy. Let's begin, <coughs> excuse me, with a modern, modern state of Israel. Now, the Bible predicted that the Jewish people would be dispersed to the four corners of the earth and regathered again. In fact, our Lord in Matthew chapter 24 gave a very specific prediction. He said that the temple that was being rebuilt by Herod was going to be not only destroyed but dismantled stone by stone. So here's the question. Did that prediction uh, reach fulfillment? Well, the answer is absolutely yes. Because in 70 A.D., all historians agree, the Titus and the Roman legions marched into Jerusalem, slaughtered thousands of Jewish people, 
and dismantled the temple. Why did they dismantle it? Because there was gold in the temple. It caught fire and they had to dismantle it to get the melting gold out, fulfilling to a T the prophecy of Christ. At this point the Jews were scattered to the four corners of the earth. Fast forward now many, many years. The Holocaust happened. And Hitler is seeking to eradicate the Jewish people from the face of the earth. And thankfully the United States of America and England and our allies stopped the Nazi war machine. And what happens in the aftermath of the Holocaust is nothing short of amazing. The Jewish people begin to return to their homeland again. And on May 14, 1948, a modern miracle happens. The state of Israel is officially declared. Here is a nation that has been dispersed for hundreds of years and they're regathered again. This has never happened again historically. David Jeremiah in his book One in the World is Going On writes, quote, Never has a decimated ancient people managed to retain their individual identity through almost 20 centuries and reestablish their nation in their original homeland. This event was specifically prophesied and it happened exactly as foretold. It was a miraculous act of God. End quote. And that's true. This was a super sign that started the prophetic clock ticking. So Israel is back in their land again. But there was still a problem. They did not have control of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem plays a key role in the end time scenario. Even though they had declared their statehood, uh, Jordan was still controlling the old city of Jerusalem, including the Temple Mount and most of the historic sites. But then the Six Day War broke out, <coughs> excuse me, in 1967, in which Israel was attacked. No one expected her to survive. Not only did she survive the attack, she won the war and gained back a lot of the things that she had lost, including the old city. So this city of Jerusalem is under Jewish control for the first time in over 2,000 years. Yet, to this present day, Jerusalem remains at the heart of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, with Arab leaders worldwide insisting that Jerusalem and the entire West Bank are rightfully Palestinian territory and must ultimately give, be given back as a condition of peace. Well, listen, I'm going to go with God on this one. God gave Jerusalem to Israel. It's her city. In Genesis 15, 18, God said to Abraham, to your descendants, I will give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates. He gave that land to Israel and they're not going to give up the city of Jerusalem. As Tim LaHaye said, quote, the smell of the Holocaust is still too fresh in their memories. And so all of this that is happening is just as the Bible predicted. So let's put it all together. Let's go over a chronology of events. Israel would be scattered. Has that happened? Yes. Israel would be regathered after she was scattered. Has that happened? Again, yes. Israel will regain the city of Jerusalem. Has that happened? Yes. Israel will be isolated from the other nations of the world and will effectively stand alone. Has that happened? Not quite, but we're getting there. And finally, Israel will be attacked. Does that happen? Not yet. Not on the scale that the Bible predicts. That is still in the future, perhaps in the near future. But it's interesting to me how Jerusalem still is the big thing. Did you notice in the Democratic Convention how the city of Jerusalem came up? Apparently in their platform they had neglected to say that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. And there was also a mention of God that they had left out. And so uh, the White House said they wanted that put back in again, but according to their protocol, they had to vote on it. And so they had the vote there in the floor, and uh, when it was put up to a vote, I heard a lot of people booing it. But yet they said two-thirds voted for it, which is an exaggeration for sure. And, uh, but here's what I found interesting, is that they're talking about Jerusalem. Why is Jerusalem such a big deal? Why are we talking about Los Angeles or Paris or Rome or, or some other major capital 
in another part of the world? Why this tiny little city? I'll tell you why. Because God said Jerusalem in the last days would play a key role. Scripture says she would be an intoxicating drink, a heavy stone, a burden for the whole world. Zechariah 12, God says, I'll make Jerusalem and Judah like an intoxicating drink to all the nearby nations that send their armies to besiege Jerusalem. On that day I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone, a burden for the world. None of the nations who try to lift it will succeed. I mean, think about this. This little city of Jerusalem. The tiny nation of Israel. Okay, so with this in mind now, let's read what the Bible says about the regathering of the Jews and then what's going to happen. Let's go over to Ezekiel 37. You mark that, right? Okay, let's look at it. Ezekiel 37. Start in verse 1. For this section I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Ezekiel says, The Lord took hold of me. I was carried away by the Spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with bones. He led me around among the old dry bones that covered the valley floor. They were scattered everywhere across the ground. Then he asked me, Son of man, can these bones become living people again? O sovereign Lord, I replied, you alone know the answer to that. And he said, speak to the bones and say, dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I'm going to breathe into you and make you live again. And I'll put flesh and muscles on you and cover you with skin. I'll breathe into you and you will come to life and you'll know that I am the Lord. We'll stop there. Now, I've spoken to dead audiences before, but <laughs> this takes the cake. Imagine this. The Lord tells the prophet to go to a valley of dry bones. This would be like God calling you to go to a cemetery. Go to the cemetery and preach to the tombstones and say you're all going to live again. <laughs> so what does this mean? What do these bones represent? Well, the interpretation is found in verses 11 to 14 of Ezekiel 37. Then he said, Son of man, these bones represent the people of Israel. They're saying we become old dry bones. All hope is gone. Now give this message from the sovereign Lord. O oh, my people, I will open your graves of, of exile and cause you to rise again. I'll bring you back to the land of Israel. When that happens, O oh, my people, you will know that I am the Lord. I'll put my spirit in you and you will live and return home to your own land. Then you will know that I am the Lord. You see, I've done everything just as I have promised. I, the Lord, have spoken. All right. This prophecy has been fulfilled. Israel has been regathered together again in their land. But here's an interesting thing. After Ezekiel 37 comes Ezekiel 38. That's a profound insight, isn't it? <laughs> but Ezekiel 37 foretells the regathering of the nation Israel. Ezekiel 38 speaks of an attack against Israel. Ezekiel 38 speaks of a large nation to the north of the newly established Jewish homeland, along with a number of allies invading Israel from every direction. Clearly, this is going to happen after the regathering of the Jews to their homeland. So it is in our future, perhaps our near future, and multiple times Scripture emphasizes this will happen in the latter days or in the last days. So this is still in the future. Ezekiel 38. Go over there now. Verse 1. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Son of man, set your face against Gog and the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against them and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around. I'll put hooks in your jaws. I'll lead you out with your army, horses, horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Especially notice verse 5 of Ezekiel 38. Here are the allies of Magog. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Now drop down to verse 8. A long time from now you will be called into action in the latter days, or the last days. You'll swoop down on the land of Israel, which will be lying in peace after her recovery from war, and after the return of her people from many lands, you and your allies, a vast and awesome horde, 
will roll down on them like a storm and cover the land like a cloud. Here's what the Lord says. At the time evil thoughts will come to your mind, you'll devise a wicked scheme. You'll say Israel is an unprotected land filled with unwalled villages. I'll march against her and destroy these people who live in such confidence. Stop there. Now that's an interesting statement. They live in such confidence. Is that true? Some would say this can't be the present day because Israel doesn't live in such confidence. This must be a future day. I would beg to differ because I think the fact of the matter is Israel does live in a certain degree of confidence today like they've never known before historically. Can you imagine a statement like that being made uh, right after the Holocaust? Hardly. Can you imagine that statement being made even after they were established as a nation or even after the 67 war? Not really. Because they should have lost those wars. They were vastly outnumbered by superior military forces, etc. But against all odds, they prevail. But the Israel of today is a far different Israel than that of the 67 or even the 73 war. Today, Israel has one of the most powerful and effective military forces on the face of the earth. Now, they're not the largest, but they are really good. Israel is known for their military prowess, for their military intelligence, and of course for quite a long time now they have had nuclear weaponry and have never felt more confident. And that is why Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has stood before the United Nations and is telling Iran to back off and he's making it very clear that if necessary is, uh, Israel will exercise a military option to take out these nuclear reactors. Now some will say, well, who cares about what, uh, you know, Mahmoud whack job says, you know? <laughs> He's just another crazy tyrant out there. Well, if you were a Jew who survived the Holocaust, you might see it a little differently. Imagine if Adolf Hitler had nuclear weaponry, uh, what he would have done with that. This is a man that makes threats and a man who has the ability to carry out those threats so Israel justly takes this very seriously and they threaten to defend themselves and they should defend themselves. Now, <clears throat> here's the question. Who exactly is Magog and these allies that march with her mentioned in Ezekiel 38? <clears throat> excuse me, let's start with Magog. Now, Magog, I'm going to have to take a drink of water here, excuse me. <clears throat> Magog was the second son of Japheth. That didn't do any good at all, did it? <clears throat> Magog was the second son of Japheth, who, according to the uh, ancient historian Josephus, settled north of the Black Sea. So that is <clears throat> the original Magog. Tubal and Meshach were the fifth and sixth sons of Jacob, whose descendants settled south of the Black Sea. These tribes intermarried and became known as Magog. All of them are to the north of Israel. In fact, in Ezekiel 39, 2, God says to Gog, I'll turn you and drive you toward the mountains of Israel, bringing you from the distant north. So if you take any map today, <clears throat> go to the north of Israel, you're going to find Russia, of course. And you're going to find those nations that used to be a part of the Soviet Union, uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. Uh, possibly even Afghanistan, and of course, Stan the Man. No, not Stan the Man, but <laughs> all the stands. Now, what do these nations have in common? They're all dominated by Islam, with a combined population of 60 million. So where does Russia come in? Well, many scholars believe that Rosh, mentioned in Ezekiel 38-2, is modern-day Russia. Certainly, these countries are in the geographical area to the north of Israel. I think you can make a pretty good case for this. There is one well-known Hebrew scholar clear back in 1827 had identified Rosh as modern-day Russia. It gets very interesting when you read about the allies that march with Magog or Rosh. We have Ethiopia, which would be the modern-day Sudan. You have Libya. I don't think Libya is hard to figure out. Libya is Libya. <laughs> Persia, well that's modern Iran. On March 21st, 1935, Persia was the official name of the country we now call Iran. 
What do all these countries have in common? They're all Islamic cultures and decidedly anti-Israel. Now let's consider Rosh uh, joining forces with these allies. Here's the question. Is there an alliance today between Russia and Iran? Well, let me backtrack for a moment and say, what if we asked this question 100 years ago? The answer would have been no. What if we asked that question 50 years ago? The answer would have been no. What if we asked that question 20 years ago? The answer would have been no. What if we asked that question 10 years ago? The answer would have been perhaps. What if we asked the question today? The answer is absolutely yes. Russia signed a billion dollar deal to sell missiles and other weapons to Iran. Over a thousand Iranian nuclear scientists have been trained in Russia by senior Russian scientists. This alliance was prophesied 2,500 years ago and only recently happened. Another sign of the times indeed. The stage is being set. The common denominator among all of these nations to the north of Israel is they hate Israel. That is clear. Uh, again, coming back to Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, uh, the leader of Iran. He made this statement, and I quote, Is it possible for us to witness a world without America in Zionism? You best know that this slogan and goal are altogether attainable and can be achieved. The regime that is occupying Jerusalem must be wiped off the map, end quote. Again, occupying Jerusalem. There's Jerusalem again. The burdensome stone. The intoxicating cup. Now where did this guy even come from? This leader of Iran. Well he is a disciple of the Ayatollah Khomeini. Remember him? He was the Muslim cleric who launched a successful 1979 revolution driving out the Shah and turning Iran into a strict Muslim state. Ahmadinejad has repeatedly called for an end of the United States and of Israel who he refers to as the uncivilized Zionist. But he believes in a person who is coming. An Islamic Messiah called the 12th Imam. And I think much to the shock of many, he spoke specifically about this Islamic Messiah in his recent message before the United Nations. Here's what he said, and I'm quoting. Allah has promised us a man of kindness, a man who loves people, who loves absolute justice, a man who is a perfect human being and is named Imam El Mahdi, a man who will come in the company of Jesus Christ. Peace be upon him and the righteous. So this Islamic Messiah, this 12th Imam, according to their beliefs, will bring about an Islamic kingdom, but first the Judeo-Christian civilization must be destroyed. For this 12th Imam to come, there must first be chaos. As uh, Benjamin Netanyahu recently told world leaders, and I quote, Iran's apocalyptic leaders believe that a medieval holy man will reappear in the wake of a devastating holy war, thereby ensuing that their brand of radical Islam will rule the earth. That's not just what they believe. That is what is guiding their policies and their actions, end quote. So with this in mind, understanding that because of their beliefs, they're trying to create this state of confusion, do you understand that economic sanctions against Iran will never work? They want chaos. They're definitely upping their game. They're definitely trying to pick a fight. They're trying to mix it up. Could this be what brings about the scenario of Ezekiel 38 and 39? No one can say with certainty, but this much we must acknowledge. It certainly could be. And we see how things are lining up. But wait a second. What about the Arab Spring? You know, the conventional wisdom was that these Arab countries are having a movement toward democracy. But really, it's a movement toward more radical Islam, uh, not unlike what Iran has today. Uh, everyone rejoiced when Muammar Gaddafi was removed from office. But what has taken his place? The Muslim Brotherhood. And the Muslim Brotherhood believe in creating an Islamic Republic and imposing Sharia law on the part of, on the people of Libya as part of the Islamic Caliphate. And they have a deep hatred for Israel and the United States. Now, Hosni Mubarak 
was the former leader of Egypt. He was ousted. Many thought that was a good thing, but who and what has taken his place? Well, he has been replaced by President Mohammed Morsi, who is a leader of the Islamic Brotherhood. What are his beliefs? Well, he made this statement in a speech recently at Cairo University, quote, the Quran is our constitution, the prophet is our leader, jihad is our path, and death in the name of Allah is our goal, end quote. Is that clear enough? This is a country, by the way, that the United States provides $1.5 billion to in foreign aid annually. So that brings up the United States. What are we doing? What's our position? Well, up to this point, we have been a staunch ally of the nation Israel. Israel is the only real democracy in the Middle East. But that is not the only reason we should support her. The reason we should support the nation Israel is because they've been placed there by God and the Jewish people are still God's chosen people. Listen, the United States needs Israel even more than Israel needs the United States. You say, well, why, Greg? I'll tell you why. <laughs> why do we need them? Because God made a promise to Abraham and his descendants many years ago. In Genesis 12, 3, he said, I will bless them that bless you, and I will curse those that curse you. You look back historically at any nation that has tried to wipe out Israel and look what happened to them. Look at Spain. Look at Germany. Look at Egypt. Look at the other nations. They've all failed. But what has America done? We have supported Israel. When they declared their statehood on May 14, 1948, the United States of America, to our credit, was the first to congratulate her and welcome her. And we have stood by her. And I believe one of the reasons that God has blessed our country is because of our continued support for the nation Israel. <clears throat> but we're backing away from that, it would appear, these days. And ultimately, America will back away from Israel. And there will be no great ally behind Israel because as we look at the scenario of Ezekiel 38 and 39, she stands alone when she's attacked by Magog and her allies. And why? Because God is going to intervene for her and he wants to get all the glory and credit. Ezekiel 38, 18, this is what will happen. When God attacks the land of Israel, God says, my hot anger will be aroused declares the sovereign Lord. And we read about God decimating the armies of Magog and her allies. And there are so many weapons there that it takes seven years to burn them. God then promises to pour His Spirit out on Israel again in Ezekiel 39, 29. That means that after Israel's attacked, there's no way they can protect herself against all these hordes that are coming from every direction. God intervenes, wipes out the majority of the army of Magog and her allies, and God pours His Spirit out in Israel, and there's a national revival. And thousands and thousands of Jews turn to Yeshua is Hamashiach. They embrace Jesus as the Messiah. Today in the world, most Jewish people do not believe in Jesus. I think I can safely say Thankfully, more and more are coming to faith in Christ, but by and large, most do not believe. Why is that? Well, the Bible tells us in Romans eleven twenty five. 25, uh, I want you to understand this, dear friends. Uh, the Jews have hard hearts, but they will, this will last only until the complete number of Gentiles come to Christ. And so, basically, right now, there's a blindness on the part of most Jewish people when it comes to the subject of Jesus. But once the blinders are lifted, if you will, there many are going to believe. But here's the thing. This will happen after the full gathering of the Gentiles be come in. What is that talking about? Well, you see, God established a covenant with Israel, but they turned against Him. So God brought us, most of us who are non-Jews, we were grafted into the promises of Israel, you see. We've been beneficiaries. But God is going to work among the non-Jews, among the Gentiles, and when the last one believes... 
Then God will pour His Spirit out on Israel. So you put this all together. A national revival coming in the nation Israel. The opening of the eyes of Jewish people globally to see Jesus as the Messiah. This is all going to happen. But before this can happen, that last person needs to believe. That means there could be a person right now that once they believe in Jesus and put their faith in Him and follow Him could be the last one the Lord is waiting for before we all leave this place and go to heaven. Maybe it's even that guy walking out. I don't know. But look, here's the thing. <laughs> Can you imagine if you knew who that last person was? If you were sitting next to them and you knew this is the one, you'd be like, believe in Jesus, you know. <laughs> it's going to happen in God's timing and in God's way. And then the rapture comes. So why are we studying Revelation? What's good about it? Well, couple things that bring to your attention. Number one, there's a blessing attached to the person who studies and keeps the words of this book. You know, no other book in the Bible has a promise like that. No book except Revelation. That's why I'm mystified by why some people would not want to study this book. What, you don't want to be blessed? How many of you want to be blessed? Raise up your hand. Oh, okay, good. That's why we're studying it. We want the unveiling. We want to see what's happening. Look at verse 3 of chapter 1 again, Revelation. Blessed is he that reads and hears and keeps the words of this prophecy and keeps the things that are written in it for the time is near. So if you want to get the blessing, here's what you first need to do. Number one, you need to read it. Just technically read it. The word translated read is to read out loud. Read out loud the book of Revelation. Understand the book of Revelation. But it doesn't stop there. Number two, you must hear the words of the prophecy. You know, sometimes you can hear someone say something and not hear them at all. Let me put it another way. Sometimes your wife talks to you and you don't pay attention. <laughs> your wife says, honey, I think we need to spend more money on redecorating. And you hear her saying, blah, 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 blah. She says, honey, can I have the remote control? And you hear her saying, blah, blah, blah. See, you're, you know, you don't, you don't listen. And it's possible to listen and not listen, right? You tune something out. Here's what God is saying. Don't just read it. Listen to it. Pay attention to it. If you are merely to read the book of Revelation, there's a great work of literature, a religious writing. You won't necessarily get that much out of it. But if the Holy Spirit opens your eyes and your heart and your mind to what God is saying, it can make all the difference in the world. And number three, this blessing is promised to those who keep the things that are written in it. It's not enough to just read it. It's not even enough to just hear it. You must apply the truths in your life. What does that mean? Well, look. If I believe Jesus is coming back and it doesn't affect the way that I live, I have missed the point. You know, I've met people that are like, I don't know how I would describe them, Bible prophecy aficionados. You know, they just love to argue the fine points of prophecy, and that's all right if you want to do that. But I've met people that can quote chapter and verse and give you a good overview of the proper chronology of events of the end times who are not living a godly life. And to that person I say, you're missing the whole point. If it doesn't impact you in the way that you live, you've missed what Jesus is trying to say. He didn't say when these things begin to happen, argue about it. He said when these things begin to happen, look up for your redemption is drawing near. That's it. <laughs> look, we might disagree on some fine points here and there on Bible prophecy, and, and I respect your right to be wrong, but... <laughs> no, serious, I have friends that we might debate subpoints. That's fine. But we can't debate this point. Jesus Christ is coming back soon. We can't debate that point. So let's not be sidetracked with minutia and miss what God is saying. You got to hear it. First, you have to read it. Then, you have to hear it. Then, you have to keep the words that are written in it. 1 John 3.3 3 says, All people who have this confidence in Christ that He's coming 
will keep themselves pure as Christ is pure. Are you keeping yourself pure? And by that, the Bible is saying you seek to live a godly life. That doesn't mean you live flawlessly or perfectly. No one does. But it means you make every effort every day to walk as closely with the Lord as you possibly can. Is that a description of you? Or are you living a compromised life? Or are you living in two worlds? The Bible gives many warnings about that servant that says, Oh, my Lord is delaying his coming and begins to eat and drink and get drunk and do wicked things. And the Lord warns that that person will not be ready when he returns. Don't forget Jesus said, one will be taken and the other will be left. Two men will be in the field. One is taken, the other is left. Some will be left. And the ones that will be left are the ones that are not right with God. They're pretending to be a Christian. They're playing some religious game. And let me tell you something. The only person they're really fooling is himself. You can't fool God any of the time. You can fool some of the people some of the time. But you can't fool God any of the time. He knows. And you know if you're right with Him. So I'm going to close with an invitation. An invitation to be ready to meet the Lord. An invitation where you would say, I want to be sure that when Christ comes, I'll be one of those ones that will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And also an invitation to some of you who have been living a compromised life to make a recommitment to Jesus so you're certain you are ready. So if you need to respond to this invitation, respond now as we close in prayer. Let's all pray. Father, we've heard your word today. We see the signs of the times all around us. And I pray for everyone hearing this message, wherever they are, help them to be right with you. And if they're not right with you, help them to come to you now, we would ask. Because we know, Lord Jesus, before you come back wearing many crowns, you first came to this earth and wore a crown of thorns. We went to the cross and died for our sin. And people need to come to you now and receive the forgiveness that you provided through the cross. Help them to do that, we pray. Well, our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and we're praying. How many of you would say today, Greg, I'm not sure if I'm ready for the Lord's return. Quite honestly, I don't have this confidence that if Christ came back today or tonight or tomorrow, I would be one of those ones caught up to meet him in the air. I want to be ready. I don't have the confidence that if I were to die, I would go to heaven, but I want that confidence. Pray for me. If you want Jesus Christ to come into your life, if you want to be forgiven of your sin, if you want to know that when you die, you will go to heaven, if you want to be ready for the Lord's return, will you lift your hand up right now wherever you are? Lift your hand up where I can see it. God bless you. God bless you. Now I can't see you there outside in the amphitheater or in the court building or at Harvest Orange County, but I want you to lift your hand as well because this is between you and God. You want Christ to come into your life. Lift your hand up. Let me pray for you. God bless all of you. God bless each one. God bless. While our heads are still bowed, maybe some of you would say, hey man, I'm living a compromised life and I know it. And I don't want to live this way anymore. I want to make a recommitment to Jesus today. Pray for me. If that's your desire, would you lift your hand up? Let me pray for you today. Lift your hand up. God bless each one of you. All right, now I'm going to ask all of you that have lifted your hand, if you would please, stand to your feet, and I'm going to lead you in a prayer of commitment. Just stand to your feet. Every one of you that raised your hand, stand to your feet. Even if you did not raise your hand, stand up right now. Wherever you are, outside of the amphitheater, stand to your feet. Up in the court building, stand up. Harvest Orange County, Harvest Orange Crest, just stand to your feet right now. I'm going to lead you in this prayer. And I'm going to have you pray it out loud. Anybody else? Stand now. One final moment. God bless you. Anybody else? Stand now. One final moment. Stand now. God bless you. God bless all of you. God bless. Yes. Now you that are standing, I want you to pray this prayer out loud after me. Again, as I pray this prayer, pray it out loud after me right now. Pray with me now. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. But you died on the cross and shed your blood for every sin I have ever committed. I turn from that sin now. I put my faith in you. Make me ready for your return. Thank you for loving me and accepting me and forgiving me. 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless all of you. Praise the Lord. God bless you.